I am not somebody who's coming from a super specialised, extremely well funded service to tell you how we do and how, what we do and how marvellous it is because I find those kinds of talks really tedious. Um, I work pretty much more or less on my own in clinic uh, to do developmental assessments of, of children. I work in the community, I don't ever set foot in the hospital except to be going told that we haven't got any money left. Um, so so I am, I'm absolutely not coming as a, a sort of a tertiary specialist here. I'm a community paediatrician and I work with the, the people of Lambeth uh, and Lambeth alone and uh, I'm essentially a developmental person who has drifted into ADHD because no one else was doing it. Um, <coughs> equally I am the mental health officer for the Royal College, that's a new post and I think it's, it's important to just to be aware that the Royal College has a fairly limited role in national policy. Having said which, we're going to talk about national policy first, and then we're going to talk about screen time, and then finally we're going to talk about uh, assessments, and I'm going to make the case for not having uh, specific ADHD diagnostic clinics, which I thought would get your attention. <laughs> um, so, first of all, I actually want to ask you a question, rather than tell you things. What should national policy, what should we be delivering for children and young people with ADHD via national policy? What should be the aims of any national policy is understanding and training in schools? Absolutely. But it's not clear how that's achievable via national policy. That's one of the problems. Consistency of provision. Yeah. So, I will go back to that, but you're quite right that, that, that there's, there's a the postcode lottery in ADHD is phenomenal. Well, you know, here you have actually more than many other people do. And, and lots and lots of parents who are able to either access things yeah. or know someone who knows how to access things sure. or pay someone. And, and Lambeth is quite a different borough to Richmond, yeah. it's fair to say. Um, and I think that you know, there are different dynamics there. Um, yeah, that's very true. What else? Um, convince all GPs that ADHD is a real thing, um, even the ones who are a bit old and have kind of just got a bit lazy and dismissed it. Um, and the, other, the final thing to, to, to I would add to that is uh, educate GPs that a child sitting still for 20 minutes does not mean they don't have ADHD, um, which is another constant irritation of mine. Uh, okay. Early and straightforward diagnosis. Yeah. So access to, and, and this is where I'm, I'm going to go on to at the end, because I do absolutely agree with that, but I have a specific view about, about specific um, dedicated clinics. Actual provision for support within schools, yeah. not just the training, actual additional help. Yeah, absolutely, and schools are under a huge amount of pressure. Um, school support services are really being stripped away, so yeah. Good support for parents. Yeah. So what do you mean by good? I just want to, because that's, that's a really interesting question, isn't it? I think parents often beat themselves up about their children thinking they've done something wrong. Mm. And I think parents need a lot of reassurance that it's not their fault. Yeah, that is a really interesting insight, isn't it? Because people think, oh, support for parents <coughs> means a course, or it means somebody, no. you know, talking them through. It is. It is often just somebody just saying someone you're doing a great job. Yeah, <laughs> I think and specific courses for parents with ADHD, because I think you go to a professional and say, oh, you need a parenting course. Yeah, and it's, you're told then, actually, it's your fault. Your child is like this, and it's not. It's a, and I guess that comes back to the lack of their understanding. But it's not yeah. a normal parenting course that <coughs> parents of children of ADHD need, they need a specific yeah. and probably more smaller or more one-to-one, -one. The, the, so they the need more specific su uh, support, so more individual support as the child does. I complete, I, I agree with that from my own personal view and my own personal experience that not only is it more useful for the parents of children with ADHD to go to an ADHD specific parenting course, it's also an awful lot easier to get them to go because the way I put it is to, to people with AD, kids with ADHD, uh, parents of kids with ADHD, is that look, you're already an eight out of ten parent, but unfortunately, in order to deal with this child with this condition, you need to be a nine point five out of ten parent all the time, and that's really hard. What I think is hard for people who are already eight out of ten parents 
is to go to a course which is designed to turn people from six or five out of ten parents into seven or eight out of ten parents. Do you see what I mean? That's a very kind of simplistic view, but and I think it is really hard for people to sit there and be told things that they've kind of worked out for themselves for five weeks um, in order to say, I've been on a parenting course. The difficulty is that the, the research evidence doesn't support my instinct that it is better to go to a parent-specific, a, a, a condition-specific parent group. But the, the reason for that, I think, is that the quality of the parenting groups in a research study is going to be much higher than it is once it's been rolled out. But there aren't any, there are very limited amount of parent-specific courses for, for ADHD, so how can that... Come well, out? people have looked into specific courses, courses for, specific, for specific groups and didn't show any benefit over a, a course which was open to everyone. Do you see what so I mean? How large is that study? All, yeah, that, of, course, of course there's always those problems <coughs> with the whole parenting literature, but I think also the, the generic, generic ones in the study are probably of a much higher quality than a generic one which is just being offered by a local authority at the moment by someone who may not even really <coughs> understand ADHD. Do you see what I mean? So it's a very different kettle of fish. So I continue in Lambeth to push for ADHD specific parent courses, although uh, it's a bit of an uphill struggle for reasons I'll talk about. Do you find that um, when you go to, uh, we, I, I did something that called Families Helping Families through Me Too and Co. Yeah. And, and I found that um, going to a group where everyone had children with a, a similar diagnosis yeah. and we were able to share ideas and the person who was leading the group had a child who was, who was further up the line you know, in terms of age um, and was able to guide us through the process. And, and it was good, it was perfect. It was counselling, it was ideas from other people, yeah. and support as well, and it sort of stopped the isolation, which can, you know, happen. It's absolutely clear, and it's clear from the literature, that the thing that people benefit from, from a parenting group, is not the facilitator, it's no. the other families yeah. with whom they discuss. And a good facilitator knows this. Um, we're very attracted in Lambeth by that model of parent peer support, and... It's a bit early days, but there is a proposal to set something up like that with some of our colleagues, colleagues they are, are from the parent group, and they've kind of got some proposals together, and they've even got a name for what they want to do, but which is good. Um, uh, uh, it's just a question of getting commissioners interested and, and everyone on side. Max, we should say that ADHD Richland has the One Two Three Magic program. Do you know that? I am aware of the One Two Three Magic book and, okay. uh, and program. I'm. My only worry, having read the book, is that it's not particularly warm. It's not got that kind of uh, emotional connection that you get from something like The Incredible Years, where you have, you know, you work first on having a connection that will then allow you to have what I would call leverage over the child's behaviour. One, two, three, manage, magic. Although it's very quick and effective, I worry that it it skips that step of really reinforcing your relationship with the child. So if you have a relationship with the child, 123 Magic is a great way to jump in. But a lot of the families that we're dealing with, they just don't have that relationship. And so jumping in with 123 Magic, which is quite a behaviorist approach, without the, the building relationship can, be, can backfire, in my experience. You see, Incredible Years, another course or something? Yes, Incredible Years is the, uh, the Stratton, um, Carolyn Webster Stratton's course. It's longer, and it takes a, in a way, it takes longer to get to the point. The great thing about 123 Magic is it gets to the point extremely quickly. But I do think Incredible Years, which actually I have to say has got a better evidence base than any other parenting course, the Incredible Years has that advantage of, of building relationships, being... The, the absolute cornerstone and the thing that you spend quite a lot of time on. Sorry, yeah, I know you. Yeah, I know. It's okay. I was just saying, um, going to their support group for the young young people because you know, um, or people going into school because my son's got terribly low self esteem yeah. because you know once he got diagnosed, he's fourteen nearly, so right. he was devastated yeah. because he's got the stigma of feeling every, that your life's over once you've got something like this. Is how he felt. Because okay. he, that, you know, maybe everybody has different experience, but for him, he really took yeah. it badly because he just feels, you know, it's another thing. Yeah. yeah. yeah so I think it's that, really tough for the yeah. adolescents to get yes. diagnosis, actually. Yeah. It's much easier for them to accept it early I on. I wish we'd got it. That's the other thing, yeah. is getting the early diagnosis. I agree, actually. Yeah. 
Yeah. Sorry, was that what we were No, so saying? I was just going to say, yeah, support and maybe people going into schools to, you know, be positive, like yourself, giving positive yeah. messages, because there's so much negativity still around yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I completely agree, and I think one of the things that worries me is the fact that the money for health commissioning is increasingly on a you get the money to do this bit of work with this person, but there's no money for the broader work around the local system, for the sort of stuff that I've been doing kind of for free, going into schools and talking to schools. And, and I know that lots of people don't do that because, because that's not the game, that's not the system. They're not paid to do it, so they don't do it. And that's increasingly what's happened in, in CAMS particularly. I think cultural perception, I think ADHD is maybe 20 years behind autism. Um, and I think, I think we, there's a huge amount of work to do. I, I'm, I, I think having an APPG is great, but I think really things like the Rory Bremen documentary will change a lot more minds. So I think more of that kind of engaging public conversations and public programmes, I think, I think are fantastic. I'm not sure you'll... I can't see a time when you get the degree of understanding and acceptance that you get in autism because there's always this thing you butt up against which, about behaviour and, and well, disruptive behaviour. So, like, you know, no, 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 absolutely. Sure. You know, Mark Ruffalo, uh, Michael Phelps, all these people, they have it, and then I think then that does help. That's great, the Hulk has ADHD, yeah, I love yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he does, doesn't he? Yeah, really? yeah, yeah. We really like him yeah. when he's angry. Um, okay. Now, um, as well, I've been, I've been in mental health policy for considerably longer than I've been the mental health officer for college, and oh man, it's hard work. Um, so I'm just going to quickly run you through things, and, and, and it's not a particularly pretty story. All right, mental health, first of all. <laughs> let's just tell a quick story about the state of mental health uh, provision for children and young people in the UK. Up until 2010, I, I had some experience of it, and it always struck me that the, the big problem was variability, as you've said. Um, it seemed to be dependent, essentially, on what the interest of the local psychiatrists were, what was provided, and psychologists as well, what was provided and how it was provided. Um, <coughs> I trained in Reading, uh, where there was a brilliant child psychiatrist who was really interested in, in ADHD and got really good training and the ADHD kids got a reasonable deal, although not so much in the schools. And then I came to Lambeth and the CAMS had no interest in ADHD. They kind of begrudgingly took them, but they didn't really have any kind of drive. So that was the situation uh, before 2010, but then of course there was this um, period of I mean, unbelievable cuts between 2010 and 2015, um, and our local CAM service lost 40% of its funding. Just, and it wasn't even a deliberate policy, it was just simple neglect. Uh, the fact that people just didn't realise that because the money was, the tap of money was stopped, and that you continued to have uh, rising, uh, sort of compulsory spending on adult care, then all children's services were really suffering, because we don't have any compulsory spending in children and so this is this is one important this is one important thing that, that kind of overlays all of the health stuff is that in adult care you have to spend money as a commissioner on cancer and, and heart disease you are absolutely obliged to do it because there are really strong uh, targets in a whole of children's care children young people's there is nothing that you have to spend money on so that's a huge problem um, so that's what, that's what happened, it got neglected for a while, and then we had Future in Mind. Have you all heard of Future in Mind? Okay, so it's really interesting, because Future in Mind is the kind of guiding document of the last few years in children and young people's mental health. And it's a funny, it came out in 2015 from the Department of Health, it's a funny document. It doesn't mention any condition by name. And this is one of the problems with the mental health um, uh, re reform process that's going on is that by not mentioning mental health by name and also by not defining what mental health is, it allows people to apply their own definition of what mental health is and is not. And so really essentially what happened in the future in mind is that on the surface it was a very well-intentioned document. We had lots of them write messages about working together, you know, early intervention, early assessment, 
um, you know, joint working between across agencies, but actually no mechanisms for ensuring that any of this happened. And underneath it, there was a little motor starting up, and that motor was Children and Young People's uh, I Act. Has everyone heard of that? Okay, the Ch CYP I Act. Don't worry about it. It's essentially um, a way of making CAMs like the rest of medicine, as in that it's outcome-based, it's treatment protocols, and it's quite a scientific process, and you, you, know, you kind of go in, you go through, you get your treatment, you measure your outcomes, and then you're spat out the other end, hopefully better. Like the rest of medicine, it has its good and, it has its strengths, it absolutely, you absolutely know what you're doing, whereas sometimes previously CAMs would drift along with people for a long time and no one was quite clear what was going on. The difficulty is, it is laser focused on anxiety and depression. There is also, in theory, uh, you know, uh, CYP IAPT in autism, uh, learning disability, and you know, par parenting can also be delivered by that. But most of the uptake is on uh, anxiety and depression. So that has become, by default, what mental health now means. It now means anxiety, depression, and then the things that CAMs always have to do because <laughs> no one else will do it. So uh, self-harm, because of course, of course the number of self-harm, young people self-harming has ballooned and so services have had to keep up with that, particularly with uh, the crisis care uh, legislation that's come through, so they have to spend a lot of money on self-harm. And of course psychosis and eating disorders, and no one would begrudge them having good quality provision for those conditions, of course. However, ADHD is missed out. It's not the only place thing that's missed out. Conduct disorder generally has missed out, and um, uh, neurodevelopment and ASD is missed out. And actually, um, anyone who is in a paediatric clinic with uh, uh, odd symptoms, medically unexplained symptoms, conversion disorder, any of those kind of odd things, have completely missed out as well. So. ADHD is one of the many categories of difficulty which are really being ignored within, within the mental health uh, reform program. That is not a good, that's not a happy story. Of course, we have got the asset that there is a nice guidance in, 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 um, in ADHD, but it doesn't, it's not clear to me that there is any uh, mechanism for actually imposing that upon local areas and local commissioners. It doesn't seem to me that there's an effective one. There are, in every area, and Richmond will have one, a local transformation plan for CAMS. Is everyone aware of the local transformation plan for CAMS? Right, so this is a really important document and it would be helpful if you, your group could engage as forcefully as possible with it. Because essentially, and this is probably something I may regret allowing to be on the open internet, um, <laughs> when you're pr producing as a CAM service your local transformation plan, you're more or less accountable to NHS England, but not really to your own local population. I don't think that the mechanisms for making you accountable to your partner agencies, I mean, I, th I don't know, I get, did not get any uh, communication about our local transformation plan in Lambeth um, and you're not accountable directly to it by but to your local population I think it's very weak and essentially you will have to deliver what NHS England want you to deliver and what NHS England want you to deliver is more bums on seats more throughput and what's the best way to get lots of throughput well you have to do your you have to do the things you have to do but then CYP IAPT, you're you know, churning through loads and loads of brief inter interventions for anxiety and depression. That is a really good way of getting through and pleasing NHS England. So that's what everyone's doing. It sort of is the, that's, the, that's how the game's been set up. That's what you do. Um, so, so that's another, that's another really big challenge is this lack of, of local accountability. <coughs> so I think, I think that covers most of where, where I want to go with with mental health, um, but but ch pressure on uh, pressure on um, mental health is is a really important thing that, that you can do because ultimately this is a, these are political decisions that are being taken and politics is the sum of voters. If you're you, know, you are voters, so so making your voices heard is really important. 
Of course, the thing I've forgotten to talk about before I move on from mental health is the green paper which is published in December on children and young people's mental health. Are you all aware of that? You see, it's extraordinary that people, and it's not your fault because they snuck it out just before Christmas and they did do a national consultation, this is brilliant, they did a national consultation event on the Monday of half term. And, they t and we found out on the Friday beforehand. So I don't know who went. Um, <laughs> they are extraordinary. Um, and so, you know, they will say this was extensively consulted on. And there is an online consultation, and you can look it up, and you can go and make your voice heard. I am not a fan of it, you may have guessed. <laughs> what it does is it suggests uh, a mental health lead for schools. That's okay. Most of them already have one, but that's fine if you make it. Oh, no, if you made it compulsory, I'd be all for it. But they're not even making it compulsory. They want to encourage schools. Because ideologically, this government will not make schools do anything. Because ideologically, they believe that head teachers are always right. And should never be interfered with, with any of their judgments. Um, I mean, that was, ba that was essentially what Michael Gove thought, and it hasn't really changed over time. Um, so, 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 that's, so that's one thing they're doing. The second thing they're doing is um, setting up, well, they're looking at, looking at setting up, and in fairness to them, they're going to pilot and evaluate. The difficulty being that when the government pilots and evaluates things, hey presto, it's always brilliant. Um, and and a lot of us are a bit sceptical about that. So for instance, they produced figures uh, a few years ago about the Troubled Families program that said to show that 98% of troubled families had been turned around, at which point everyone went, say what? Because that's, that's just unbelievable. And then a few years later, it turned out that there was complete they were complete rubbish figures, and, and the troubled families has been quietly buried. Um, although it's still going on, but it's, it's not being talked about. Anyway, so this is what they're going to do next, which is these mental health support workers within schools. Now, it's not clear how it's going to work. It certainly seems that there's going to have to be an awful lot of people, an awful lot of these people, but they're going to be embedded in schools and provide mental health support within schools. That sounds like a really good thing. The difficulty is, what are they going to be able to deliver? They'll be able to deliver short, short interventions into anxiety and, and mild to moderate anxiety and depression. Does that sound familiar? That's the, that's the throughput again. It's how much, you know, what the government wants is to be able to treat X number of children and say, we have treated X number of children by 2020. That's, that's, that's the target. And whether that treatment is needed, beneficial, leads to any long-term outcomes doesn't actually matter politically. That's what they want. Jeremy Hunt must be able to say that in 2020 during the election campaign and put this issue to bed electorally. But within the schools, those people who are appointed in those roles, what kind of training are they? Well, that's, a, that's an excellent question and there's a lot of discussion about that. How on earth can they deal with the complexity? Absolutely. And I think what the, the, danger, I, the, the danger I feel about this proposal is that they will deal with the simple stuff and the, 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 more com it, the more complex stuff, which is, oh, it's not, oh, we can't deal with that. They'll say, oh, it's social. If there's any kind of social vulnerability, oh, it's a social, social care issue. Because I know this, because this is what paediatricians have done for years. It's a social care issue, it's not really for us. Or if it's an educational issue, oh, it's more of an education issue. See if you can get an educational psychologist to see them. And that's okay. Uh, it's very confusing for parents. Absolutely. And so they are going to run some parenting courses, but again, we've had the discussion about parenting courses and, and their limitations. They're not of no use, but they are limitations in the use, particularly if they're not done by highly trained people. So I, get, I understand that as well. So you've already really hit upon the difficulties with this model. Well, I've witnessed it, and you know, I've got the school my child was attending, the Senko was off sick on. Uh, for you know, most of the year, and yeah. so the deputy head was handling that role. She had no knowledge yeah. of any kind of special educational needs. So yeah. uh, you know, but you know, as far as the school was concerned, they were fulfilling their responsibilities because they had appointed someone, yes. someone who couldn't actually do the job. Yes, and the only thing you need in order to satisfy Ofsted is to have someone in the job. And that's just one tiny example. But you know, yeah. when you're saying things like that, it really scares me because I've witnessed it. Like people yeah. on train and come handle situations. So it's not all, all is not lost. There is, of course, the consultation, uh, and we have put in a, a fairly uh, robust uh, response to the consultation. Um, I think they could be a useful group if they are embedded in a local system. 
And I think systems, I mean, everyone talks about systems rather than services when it comes to mental health and it comes to supporting children and young people. Um, but no one's actually doing anything about it, and the Green Paper doesn't do anything about it. Our proposal, I don't know if you're all aware, you're all aware of the local offer for special educational needs. It seems to me that a local offer kind of model would be helpful for mental health as well as that, because partly because it'll make everyone go, okay, what are we actually offering here, and where are the gaps, and also because it, increase, it increases the visibility of those gaps, and therefore it's a way of driving accountability. That's my theory. Finally, of course, you can then inspect it. Because actually inspection of CAMS is very much about the specialist service. And of course, if the specialist service don't take half, you know, 90% of the children with needs in the community, they can actually look quite good because they're only dealing with what they deal with. Uh, where I think inspection of mental health provision should be about the area, not CAMS services. Does, does that make sense to everyone? So I think that's something that we can do, but I just, I'm not necessarily, I get a lot of people nodding and then not, not much follow up. I'm not, not having a go at you guys, but, <laughs> but anyway, that's my idea. Um, now I am going to move on, on from mental health. And so what's the situation within paediatrics? Because we need to look at our own house and get our own house in order before we start throwing stones around in mental health. And it isn't great, I have to say. Um, that one of the things that hangs over all of this is this status of ADHD and, in fairness, the rest of the neurodevelopmental disorders as somewhat in between mental health and paediatrics. They are developmental disorders and therefore paediatrics is increasingly interested in them. We, you know, it comes essentially from the fact that we've always had paediatricians doing development and we're actually rather good at it. And people like me have gone, well, if we're doing under five developments and we're good at that, why don't we try and look at the development of children over five? Because there has been a tradition that anyone over five basically is a, is a question for education. And if, if, if desperate comes and we don't get involved, and I think that's profoundly wrong, but I'm not necessarily in the majority. Um, so... Really, for me, our interest in ADHD comes from a developmental perspective. It comes from being interested in children's development. And actually, it also comes from the fact that, um, this may be a small, small tangent, it comes from the fact that if we all, we, paediatrics is increasingly the agency for diagnosis of autism. But it's meaningless to, to have an diag autism diagnostic service if you can't also identify the differential diagnoses, the other things that might be going on. And also, you know, the, the, so... A, um, dyspraxia or DCD, ADHD, uh, anxiety, depression, uh, trauma, all of those things you have to know about. So therefore we are committed in paediatrics to uh, being involved in ADHD. Now, I have a little bit of good news. Um, from the point of view of commissioning, it's still very unclear. There isn't any clear commissioning guidance for neurodevelopmental conditions. Um, there are some moves in that direction, but it is, fant it is very slow. Um, all I can say is that at the very highest level, it is acknowledged that this is an area which we have really done badly on, but no, I can say no more than, I'm not keeping a secret, it's the head of S NHS England for mental health who said that to me, but we haven't got any further than that, I'm afraid. Um, but there, there, is, there is increasing recognition that ADHD is part of our remit, at least to an extent. So within the new community child health, so community paediatrics is, is sort of my area, there is a clear, on, on the first page, commitment that diagnosis and management of ADHD is part of the training. Now, of course, that will take a long time to filter through, but that's the first time that that's happened, and I'm delighted by it. Um, there, is, there are more and more paediatricians interested, uh, there, but, but again, because the commissioning is not consistent and because it's messy, very often paediatricians are going far above uh, what they're commissioned for in ADHD in order to fill in gaps, because that's the culture in paediatrics, we sort of, we sort of expand to fill the gaps where other things are. Um, and so there's a lot of pressure for people to stop doing it. What should the paediatric role in ADHD be? Um, my view 
is it sort of varies actually, but we certainly I think it's within our scope to diagnose. I think it's within our scope to to do that kind of reassurance that we were just talking about, the kind of explanation and the family support, which I think is really really important. Um, I think we can signpost to to good uh, local if there are good local services, we can signpost for family support, and I think we can do some medication. Um, I think where it becomes a bit trickier to be in paediatrics is where you get the older children um, and where either you're diagnosing and the, the differential is more kind of is this an onset of a mental health condition, um, um, an emotional health condition, is this you know, related to substance misuse which unfortunately is something that we have to think about in Lambeth a lot, um, you know, is there something else going on so and also the adolescents tend to have a different kind of pattern of coexisting conditions so much more anxiety, depression, and, and, and actually substance misuse as a consequence of ADHD as well as a, possibility, a possible alternative explanation. Do you see what I mean? So, so at that point, my personal view is that we, we definitely need CAMS, at the very least, involved. So we can't do it alone, I suppose that's the, the message of what I'm saying. We can't just take ADHD from CAMS and say, you're not doing this properly, we're going to do it. Partly because we have a lot of money, and actually because we, we probably don't have the skills to do the whole thing. So there are there is progress, um, and I think I think there will continue to be progress. But we're at the point now where we need to sort out um, we sort out as you were saying consistency of commissioning, and, and that is very hard to come by. Um, where does um, therapeutic intervention fit in? that then in terms of yeah. what we're talking about what paediatricians can do Absolutely. because I think one of the, the big sort of stresses for families is that um, basically getting an ADHD diagnosis once you've got over that hurdle is what can you do for me now yeah. um, and it's usually you can give me some medication yeah. or nothing yeah. um, at CAMS <coughs> but, there, but there seems to be a definite role for yeah. some kind of therapeutic and other interventions, I think we, wonder where paediatrics fits in. Well, I, I, I think that's absolutely right, and I think the ideal model is one where paediatricians are involved, but we can't do everything, you're quite right. So in under, in, in, in under 11s, the, we have to stick to the nice guidance, because what, what, however much we would want to have other things involved, we're not even achieving what's in the nice guidance. So let's do that first, and then we can look at other options. So in the under 11s, it is essentially good quality, you know, psychoeducation, which is essentially what we're talking about, the reassurance and the, and, the, and the talking through things and the coaching. And I would add actually to that things like problem solving around sleep and problem solving around eating and problem solving around, you know, particular situations, which I think a pediatrician can do um, quite well. But you're right, the, but the only other thing non-pharmacologically that's in the NICE guidance is parenting support. In the over 11s, in the second, in the adolescent population, there is a recommendation for psychology-led uh, intervention into the to, to the ch the young person oh, themselves. Not I don't. It's, it's a mi it's, it's what it says in the nice guidance is a kind of mixture of different things. Um, so I think it's it's a bit it's a little bit vague, and I am not aware of it being delivered in an awful lot of places, which is a shame because it's not necessarily a massively expensive intervention. I mean, our CAMs have talked about delivering it for as long as I've been in Lambeth, and they're still not delivering it. Um, it's just seen as a bit optional, um, which is odd because it's in the NICE guidance, and we should be auditing against the NICE guidance, but it's just, I don't know if it happens in, well, I mean, I suppose what Val's doing is a bit like some, that. Yeah, some people can get CBT um, at our CAMs in Richmond sometimes. So, I mean, the evidence for CBT and ADHD is not fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's pretty useful for associated anxiety and depression features. And it may well be when there's comorbid. Absolutely, and you know, anxiety will make ADHD an, an awful lot worse, and it's underdiagnosed, I think, in ADHD, I have to say. Um, but that sort of, I mean, in a way, it's almost the, the, the young person's equivalent of the peer support, isn't it? It's ha getting them all together and talking about how awful and horrible and difficult it is, and also brilliant having ADHD as a young person. So that's the situation in paediatrics. Now education, this is number one. This is always number one, isn't it? Now, the first uh, thing about ADHD that obviously you all know is that it is a special educational need. You have a diagnosis of ADHD, by definition, falls under the SEN code of practice. No questions. That no one can challenge, should be able to challenge that. 
However, the provisions, if you haven't got any HCP, as you know, the provisions and the, the requirements of school are pretty poor. They just have to do their best. This is another example of the government not wanting to tell schools anything, not wanting to make schools do anything unless they absolutely have to. So if you're stuck in this SEN, point, if, in this SEN phase of education, and I apologise, you probably know lots about this because you're living it. If you're stuck in that SEN but not EHCP phase of the education um, escalator, then you're at the mercy of the professionalism and interest of your Senko and your head teacher, aren't you? Mm -hmm. And there you have the problem of a cultural difficulty that education has with understanding ADHD. I have worked very hard over time, and I think we've made progress, and it's really a generational thing. The, you, the younger generation of, of teachers seem to be getting it much more, but the older generation have found it very difficult. And you've obviously all heard the things, oh, all this ADHD stuff, it was never like that before, they're just naughty children, they just need to shut up and be quiet. And I'm not sure we've completely helped ourselves. So, so one of the things that, that, that encourages this is if where you have, it doesn't take many diagnoses of ADHD that are a bit dodgy, that kind of aren't really ADHD, that are more kind of a child who's had a difficult upbringing and, and is, is a bit conduct disordered and has learned to quite unhelpful patterns of negative behavior, often from families but also from peers, who's not really ADHD but manages to get a diagnosis because they're schools are, they kind of look a little bit like ADHD and somebody wanted to be a clever doctor and do something. It's always a temptation in medicine to be the clever doctor and be the person who comes in like a, a white knight and solves the problem. And it's, it's extremely dangerous. Um, so let's say you've got, it only takes a few of those slightly dodgy diagnoses for teachers to go, well, you know, that people are just using it as an excuse, aren't they? And you hear that a lot. And I think sometimes it doesn't help if we, if we do say, and parents unfortunately do, well not we, but if parents say he can't help if he's got ADHD. So you've got this genuine dilemma of somebody who is a teacher who is has someone who's exhibiting a behavior which is a mixture of ADHD symptoms and the understandable but unacceptable looking for status, trying to make your friends laugh, trying to boost your self-esteem, because your self-esteem is often very, very low, and um, how do you bring it up? Well, actually, adopting a, a clown, you know, class clown persona, you know you're funny, quite often they are, very often they are, you know you're funny, you know that you're not going to get status from being necessarily best at sport or best at, best at, best at, in your subjects, I know, let's make everyone laugh, let's, let's be a little bit of an artful dodger. It's always struck me as a really interesting character in fiction, the artful dodger, I'm sure he had ADHD. Um, um, and let's let's do that. And culturally it's kind of accepted to be a little cheeky chappy, but of course it, it does lead to big problems, particularly with the rather rigid um, uh, structures, or disciplinary structures, which increasingly, particularly in secondary schools, are in place. So there is a dilemma, there's a genuine dilemma that I appreciate facts that the teachers have and head teachers have, that you can't just say, oh well, well they, you, there's all the rules that don't apply to you. But at the same time, that attitude betrays a little bit of a misunderstanding, because none of us in this room would say children with ADHD don't need rules. I mean, they clearly do, don't they? They really do. They need very clear, very, very uh, uh, unequivocal and very, and very consistent boundaries. We know this. The question is how you respond to those boundaries being breached. Do you respond with anger and pointing fingers and negativity, or do you point say, I'm very sorry, that's you broke, you know, you've broken this rule, and this is what needs to happen. And I think that makes a really big difference, and that's why the thing that you said that was said at the very beginning about understanding, about about not about moving away from a blame culture. We talk about that in in, uh, in, in the NHS, and we're not, recent events prove that we're not very good at moving away from a blame culture, but we should actually move away from a blame culture in schools as well. It doesn't matter if somebody's behaviour is due to this or that, 
they've done something wrong, there's, there's this consequence, but you don't need to kind of point fingers and kind of, you know, make it a moral thing, make it a kind of moral crusade. But isn't, sorry, isn't, isn't the result, the outcome the same? Whether yeah. you blame the child for doing what they did, or whether you, and you try and, you try and wrap it up, at the end of the day, that child is going to feel isolated, however you, however you present your punishment. To I think, to take one example of this, mm -hmm. so when I'm discuss I'm thinking a lot about exclusion at the moment, because we have an awful lot of kids with ADHD who are excluded. And no, so teachers will say, well, I'm afraid this child cannot stay at my school because we're unable to meet his needs, which is the phrase that you're all familiar with, and um, he's a danger to other people. That's the other thing, isn't it? That's the other thing that people say. Um, and I would say, okay, I accept that, but there are two ways of doing this. One is to permanently exclude the child in a way which is legalistic and leads to, you know, things being on their record, very great difficulty getting into another placement, and uh, basically the, the child getting the very strong impression, I'm not good enough, or you could do a managed transfer to another provision. Now, I'm not saying that a managed transfer is the answer to everything, but it feels different to the person. I think it feels different to the person to say, I think it's about how the relationship is maintained, even if consequences are put in place. But you're quite right, I would say that for the same behaviour, someone with ADHD should be given some allowance. The behaviour is the manifestation that we're dealing with, yeah. is an unmet need of some kind, or a lack of skill, or a lack of something going on. Um, and so as well as um, giving a consequence, which is, a, is typically appropriate, as well as giving a consequence, we also need to look at what's the underlying thing going on here. So does this child have good enough social skills? Who's helping this child with managing their emotional regulation? Sure. Problem solving? You know, where's the intervention? And so... Yeah, absolutely. So that's, that's a so very, very so good point. If you've got a child that's at the point where they're being permanently excluded or managed to move, which is, um, you know, managed to move typically is from one similar setting to another similar setting. Yeah. Well, the, the other thing you should be doing at that stage is saying, and what about an education, health and care assessment? Yeah. Because Absolutely. then you might be able to put in place a structure, even if this child is, has to move, yeah. put in place the support that they need because otherwise just giving consequences works if you have a neurotypical child but generally doesn't manage the underlying unmet needs. So, so I, think, I think that point, which is almost really good enough to repeat so that the YouTube audience gets to hear us as well, um, uh, you know, it, it is that yes, of course, you need to make, you need to intervene, you need to make interventions and you need to make allow, you need to make accommodations to the child's needs and, and of course, to simply say, well you've, you've breached the rules, we're going to kick you out, it's a bit like saying, well, you know, uh, you have, we know we have problems with reading, but so what we're going to agree is that you have to read better, otherwise we're going to kick you out. It doesn't make sense. You know, they have to put in, in place interventions. The question is what we do to improve education. How national, can national policy levers be used to improve things in education? And it's very difficult to see. <clears throat> we continue, and lots of people continue, to press for uh, uh, classroom management and uh, understanding mental health to be part of teacher training. However, they will always come back and say, well, there's only a, there's only a very... Teach training is amazingly short, and they, well, where's, where's the space? What do you want us to kick out? One of the things, of course, we must press for on the green paper is that when you have the mental health lead, that that needs to be integrated with the SEN agenda, and that mental health isn't just about picking up the sad and, the, the sad and worried people. It's about picking up the fact that this child who's disruptive may have ADHD, or this child who does have ADHD and is being disruptive is being treated as somebody who has, you know, using an SEN framework rather than with a disciplinary framework, or if, excuse me, with, with both frameworks. So it's, it's uniting those frameworks in the school seems to me to be an important thing that can be done with a national policy lever. Uh, but ultimate, and, and ultimately, of course, provision of better uh, support services. Uh, which is part of the commissioning issue. Um, educational psychology is really ignored as uh, a potential lever for helping mental health in schools in a work green paper which is all about mental health in schools. It's a bit really odd that they are not talking about educational psychology uh, provision because I think that would be really helpful because they will know 
you know, they're properly trained people, uh, and they will know not to make this division between, oh, that's behaviour, oh, that's not, do you see what I mean? Oh, no, that's but again, not. that's scenario, that's very inconsistent. Yeah. EPs, because I found out recently that each school get to buy into EP yeah. time. Yeah. So from one school to the next, exactly. you know, they might request help you know, once a term or once a week, or, but it's entirely up to them. Absolutely. So rather than pouring money into, 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 into bringing in people of un unproven value with unproven amounts of training with these mental health support <coughs> workers, why don't we just, in, you know, ring fence, um, ring fence spending for educational psychology? Because their people are already there; they're highly skilled. But the problem is that would not allow Jeremy Hunt to have a legacy, <coughs> because he can then say we've recruited X number of people. But if you're just increasing, if you're just increasing the availability of existing services, that's not as whizzy when you're writing the 2020 manifesto. I'm sorry to be. I'm sorry to be a cynic, but that is how it politics is works. Uh, so, uh, anyway, I'm going to move on. So, the, the proposal, a couple of things that people have come back and said, well, what we need is an ADHD Act. Because a lot of the things that I've suggested could be wrapped up in an ADHD Act. Those of you who are aware of the ADHD Act, what else would it do? Because I don't know. I'm asking you. I would get people uh, talking about it. Wouldn't it be the stigma? People, the, the, the percentage of people that understand attention deficit disorder or attention deficit uh, hyperactivity disorder is uh, the percentage is so low against the number of people in this country that have it. Yes. And that I, it's undiagnosed. I, I agree, but I, I wonder if an act of parliament is going to make it, it, is the is the is the best lever for that. Okay, how but it, it gives it gravitas, it gives it publicity. Sure. It'll be talked about it in the papers. Yeah. Yes. It does, and it gives a parliamentary seal to the diagnosis, and, and you, 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 it would be very good. So I'm not saying an ADHD, ADHD no. Act would not be a good thing. So, my first, so that's my first thing, is, is is it the right lever to achieve what we need to achieve? What are the options? Well, just to, just to go back, one is constant pressure on the current legislative programme. So the sorts of things I've, talking, I've been talking about with, with reforming the Green Paper, uh, yeah. making it more of systems-based, um, you know, changing the changing this kind of changing the um, the focus from mental health support workers to educational psychology. Um, I would say I forgot to mention um, one of the problems is that local authorities don't have to um, gather any data on the ADHD children in their local in their schools, whereas they do have to gather data on autism. That would be a very useful change. And in fact, that's the first thing that our head of education said we're not doing enough for ADHD in our schools. And she said, well, how many are there? And we went, I don't know, <laughs> because we haven't got any way of saying. So we're trying, having to ask the schools. And you could encourage um, when the public bodies like schools are looking at their public sector equality committee <coughs> under the Equality yeah. Act, encourage them to, because they don't have to focus on yeah. ADHD in particular, but as a disability, encouraging folks. Absolutely. So there's all that of that sort of, of the guidance. relationship with exclusion. I mean, at some point, the DfE will do an update of the SCN Code of Practice. It probably won't be for a few more years, but when that happens, ADHD has to be in that document much more prominently. One of the worries I have is that the current proposal from the DfE seems to be to teach mental health as part of sex and relationship education, which is kind of missing the point of how big mental health is and how big the subject is. Um, so, so I think that's another... So there's multiple... My point is that there's multiple points that you can pressure. It's just it's very hard to keep them all in your head and kind of be aware of them all. Um, I'm afraid to say, and I, I, I say this with a heavy heart, I think it's very unlikely that you will get an ADHD Act. You have had, you have had an Autism Act, and I appreciate that, but I think that's an anomaly. There's never been an Act about a specific condition, neurodisability condition, before. And there hasn't been one since. And I think legislators would say the following. They'd say, there's all of this legislation going through about children and young people's mental health. None of it mentions any condition by name. Why should I do an act specifically for your condition and not for all the other conditions which will be, who will also be lining up to have their own act of parliament? So I'm just, and also the government haven't got any legislative energy because of, and I think I can say this in Richmond, bloody Brexit. <laughs> If I was speaking in Lincoln, I might. <laughs> might be different. I bet there's some Brexiteer in the comments. <laughs> it's going to be marvellous. 
Um, it's not me, Mad Max. That's fantastic. Do you think? Do you think? Um, do you think some standardised tests, you know, for schools, for when children start going to nurseries, so things to look out for, yeah. you know, sort of checklists. And, sure. Um, if you had sort of. The evidence base for yeah, checklists, sort of yeah. the evidence base for, for population very screening, useful, wouldn't it? it's very poor. The evidence base for population screening is very, very poor. But it's very, that there's nothing there, you know, in terms of assessments, so that you can. Well, you I, can I, absolutely. See that. And I think what, and what you could do, I suppose, is look at the inclusion of some kind of assessment in the earliest foundation stage testing. Um, I think you'd have to. The problem is what essentially you're talking about is a form of screening and, and a form of screening, but at national level. Yeah. So, but national screening things. programs of any kind have yeah. to have to fulfil very, very tight stringent criteria, and screening for ADHD is nowhere near there in it's terms such of a the broad spectrum. In terms There's of no the evidence. Way my son would have been picked up at the early age yeah. because no, he's quite. very able. So that's what there's yeah. huge difficulties with that scientifically as well as politically, unfortunately. So I'm I'm just saying that's my that's the reason why. I mean, I'm you know, very happy to put whatever weight I have behind an ADHD act, but I, it's, it's hard to persuade the college, it's hard to persuade, because the college don't actually campaign on any single, issue, any single condition issue, um, as far as I'm aware. Um, so it's hard to persuade the college to, to, to sort of take this up as a cause, um, because I don't think it's going to happen. Sorry, can I just ask, for the ADHD act, I mean, it's not just pertinent to children. I mean, people going yep. to work... And in workplaces, ADD yep. or ADHD can be a problem, but it can also be a, a gift. I mean, sure. it's, I mean, sure look at most what historically was called the alpha type yep. personality was typically your ADHD. Um, I don't know, I don't know. I think there's a lot of beta type ADHD kids, but people think, around. But it, but it would not work for that, for that is not just seen as a, um, where, it's, where help is needed in children <coughs> and adults. Many adults need it. That's why I guess maybe where a lot no, of adults have children. Absolutely right. And, and, and an ADHD Act would be a desirable thing. If we could have one today, it would be brilliant. It's just a question of whether it should be the focus. There's always finite, I have this argument with people, there's always a finite energy that people have, particularly if it's not their full time job, in, that can go into a cause. And so therefore, you have to be rational and you have to be hard nosed about where you put your energy. We've had this problem in, in paediatrics and mental health. You know, we've, we've, we've spent huge amounts of energy on a, on a project of, of you know, training paediatricians, and we've managed to produce about four. We should be putting our things, you know, putting our energies elsewhere. But also we have to use the legislation that we have. Yeah, um, absolutely there is, right. There is an Equality Act, and um, many people don't either know about it or don't use it yeah. um, and so in terms of schools and the Equality Act and reasonable adjustments and all yeah. of those things, um, in the first, you know, that was passed in 2010 and there was other legislation before it, um, it there was a very low uptake in terms yeah. of using the, the, the protection which is limited but using the protection it could give um, and so, you know, there is an argument that you've got something like the Equality Act that should theoretically at yeah. least encompass all different uh, and, and I don't know enough about the law, but it strikes me that a, a, you know, a really high profile case where someone with ADHD wins on disability discrimination would, would, would you know, concentrate They're a few minds. Right. Right. The association between ADHD and antisocial behaviour mm. is another thing that worries people about uh, an, uh, an ADHD act. Um, because they worry what is that going to entitle people to yeah. access or do. And so I think that that's, that's one of the other reasons why ADHD is so behind, is because it's typically not viewed as sympathetically. Yeah, well, um, I think that's what I was groping towards before. So when you said Down syndrome, everybody would immediately feel yeah. some compassion. So, so they don't necessarily feel ADHD. I think that's right, because the behaviour of an ADHD person is, not, is, is often quite hard to live with. The, the public sympathy is much harder to access. Although it has to be said, you know, living with an autistic person isn't particularly easy either. Well, and yet, and yet the fam yeah. and yet the public have come round to that. So, so I think there's two sides to that. Yeah.